Star Wars, the original Star Wars. It was before computers, but they really executed those techniques in a really clever way. All painted. Oh, no way. Dude. <gasps> I saw it. I saw a stop motion thing there. It's nuts. We're going to explain how they did it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Ren, I'm your biological father. <laughs> Hello there. Welcome back to another episode of VFX Artists React. Today we're going to be talking about Star Wars, the original Star Wars, because those three movies totally redefined visual effects in cinema. It was before computers. <laughs> so much of this stuff is like analog technology that it's almost mysterious, pure magic to most visual effects artists today. So we're going to be breaking down how they work. Have you seen it? Wait, have you seen the original Star Wars? I have seen the original Star Wars. <gasps> I'm so excited for this episode. You guys ready? You get your seatbelts on? Computers are super important in visual effects, but when they made the original Star Wars, the computers they had at the time, what they could pump out was that little wireframe rendering of the Death Star. That's the limit, that that's the, the height of computer imaging at the time. So all the crazy <laughs> compositing and work that you see, all done on film, no computers, only models in blue screen and compositing and mats using actual chemical processes. It's nuts, we're gonna explain how they did it. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. Lightsabers! Careful with that thing, that's a weapon. A little hidden jump cut here. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's hidden. It's pretty Whoa. apparent. Yeah, look how skinny it is. And the blade practically disappears. So the lightsabers, they did a couple different effects techniques when they were doing lightsabers in Star Wars. In the original early Star Wars, A New Hope, the way they did the lightsabers, they actually had, would have a stick in the lightsaber and it was covered with a retro-reflective material. Basically the same thing you'd see on like a safety vest, like when you're out riding your bike late at night. So if they shine a light from near the camera, that stick will basically reflect the light right back towards the camera and it kind of glows. Once you have that glowing stick, the other artist needs to take the film, project it onto a big uh, cell sheet like they use for animation, and trace out a little spot for the lightsaber to enhance the blade with another little light pass. The thing is, there's some shots where they couldn't have the stick on set in the lightsaber. For example, here where Luke is battling a little droid. Well, you can really see it jump around. It's jittering, yeah. So the artist is literally guessing as to how long the sword is and where it sits in the hilt. And that's the reason why it'd be jiggling up and down. Oh, yeah. It's worth noting this shot has two other very high level VFX happening at the same time. There's a little droid ball flying around, which is a stop motion element. And there's also stop motion elements on the chess table at the same time. Oh, yeah, oh the, the chess, chess table is in this shot. <laughs> This is probably where the lightsabers looked best in the whole movie. The glow looks great. The actual core white beam looks good. <laughs> the fight is so janky. Yeah. If you watch some of the raw footage, like the fight looks so rough. The funny thing is like the lightsabers are actually kind of fragile. There's a clip from uh, Return of the Jedi where Luke is going ham on Darth Vader with just the raw lightsaber and you see it go flying out. Bonk! <laughs> <laughs> It just broke on him. Yep. Uh, once they got to later episodes of Star Wars, basically rotoscope artists were doing the lightsaber effects in its entirety. They weren't relying on a retroreflective material on set to give you a bit of a glow. They actually cut out the lightsaber so that it's just see-through film for those scenes, and then they actually shine a really bright light through that little slit to expose the film itself, and that's what you get with the nice roll-off of the glow. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. because it's actually double exposing the already exposed film with something really bright. But talking about how the light lightsabers were made here and how they actually used exposing film to their advantage. It's how they did a lot of the breakthrough scenes in Star Wars. So the Death Star trench run in A New Hope is kind of like the most amazing climactic action scene of any film that decade. Yeah. This is what brought people back to the movie theaters a dozen times. For all the spaceships, they actually made real physical models and they shot them against a blue screen. And that makes sense, you just, you know, you key out the blue, right? But back then, <laughs> it was a complicated process to actually key out that blue. And that process all begins with how film reacts to light. So when you film something, you have basically three colors that make up what you see, red, green, and blue. If you put different filters in front of the lens, you can see what your red channel, your green channel, and your blue channel are looking like. For a blue screen shot, if you were to just take that shot, throw a blue filter on it, and then project that onto black and white film, the parts that were blue will appear white, and the parts that weren't blue will appear black. Once you have your 
blue pass that's been printed to black and white film, you can then go and do just the red channel. Now red is on the opposite side of the spectrum as blue. So anything that had some red exposure, all that will show up in the red pass and the blue pass. So when you combine the two, you take this black and white piece of film and now you can use this to block light. So when you are projecting things onto a piece of film to expose that, you can now use that black and white mask to let you expose one thing in the windows, for example, or the background, and another thing in the foreground. We're so used to thinking of things as being stacked these days in the computer. You have your layers. You can't work that way with film because once you expose something onto film, you can't just expose something on top of where you just expose something. You'll get a double exposure. And so that's why you need these black and white pieces of film because they actually block light from going through. That little mat will make it so only the part where the X-wing is is getting light. A little X-wing shaped silhouette is blocking any light from hitting where the X-wing element was already exposed. So it's not stacked. It's actually everything's basically cut out and having to be perfectly aligned with itself. Working with so film cool. like this is such a complicated process because you had to know exactly how everything was going to lie down in the final product before you even started filming any of that. So they filmed these miniature physical models against a blue screen, but how they moved these models is what made this special. Because they didn't move the models specifically, they moved the camera using a very special motion-controlled camera rig called the Dijkstra Flex. Using a super rudimentary computer system, basically they would program in exactly how the camera would move. They were able to do that over and over again. Instead of having a ship fly towards camera or away from camera, they would inverse that process. The camera would pull away from it or move towards it to simulate a ship moving towards or away from camera. That allowed for not only the ships to actually move in correlation to the camera, but also to stack multiple ships next to each other. They would only film one ship at a time, but in a shot like this, they were able to have Darth Vader out in front with two TIE fighters flying behind him. And they were able to do that because they had the exact same camera motion over and over and over. So you can actually see the motion blur, and that's actually captured on camera. So they pioneered an idea for Star Wars called Go Motion, where when the camera is moving frame by frame by frame along these shots of the models, when it does the exposure, it's actually moving at the same time to give you motion blur. And by adding motion blur, they say that motion blur was their secret weapon. It was their special sauce that made all this stuff suddenly look good. We did tell you guys a long, long time ago in an episode far, far away <laughs> that we would do an episode around classic Star Wars. We've got a couple special episodes coming out very soon around Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Subscribe for that. They're actually coming out for real this time. I am so excited. Now let's take a look at a scene that combines all the things we've been talking about and cranks it up to 11. The thing about a real asteroid belt is that they're never, this is like way too dense for an actual asteroid belt. <laughs> But it is look fantasy. At, Star Wars is fantasy, not sci-fi. Oh, totally. look at all these moving elements. Yeah. See that guy getting hit? The hand painted the, Yeah, the hand-drawn lightning. <laughs> so look, look at that hand-animated shadow. Oh yeah, that's right. All hand, the shadows were hand-painted. Hand-painted. Now it's an actual miniature set as opposed to a miniature prop. So they're flying a camera through the set and then Sick. grabbing the elements of the ships afterwards. Dude, that looks so good. Yeah, it does. Holy crap. Like, there's like... 80 different things going on <laughs> in all these shots. So there's foreground asteroids, which are individually filmed, as you mentioned. Actual, real, physical yeah. asteroid props. And there's like a middle layer, which is like all painted asteroids. And there's a background layer and another background layer where they're doing the same thing, where somebody just went in and painted rocks. And so they're then comping all that on film. This shot here, where the TIE fighter clips its wing, remember, for every element, you have the color print of it. You have the mat of it, you have the inverse mat of it, and then of course you have your background. So That's 25 cool. elements times like five things needed for each element. So one of the last big techniques they used for this film were matte paintings. It's an old school technique, but they really executed those techniques in a really clever way. So the scene when the Emperor shows up in Return of the Jetty, this shot right here. Wait, those aren't real people? That's not real? Wait, okay, so clearly the people moving are, that's real. The magic of something like this is that they're combining a painting with real footage. Where's the seam? The front row of troopers and some of those officers, they're real. 
Everybody else is fake. Dang. And they actually so have, it's a fake army. It's a fake army. In fact, they have cutouts so that the front guys are real, but then there's human-shaped silhouettes in the painting. So this is an example of how cool it can be, but let's look at a shot that's actually way more simple in scope, but it actually clearly illustrates how this works. They're not going to spend all that money to make that. That set would be insane. <laughs> you don't need to do that. All you need is a large piece of glass, a talented artist. What they're actually doing is they created a stage and Alec Guinness is actually just walking along a platform maybe three or four feet above the ground. And they basically just painted into the distance underneath it. And there's a hole in the glass that is a perfect little cutout to have the footage be revealed or projected from behind. Now the quality of your matte paintings entirely dictates how real things look. And it's worth pointing out that Star Wars had some of the best matte painting artists in the world. Death Star, painted. The trees in that radar dish, all painted. That landing platform, all painted. Oh, no way. That at, at is a real model, but everything else around it is painted. This shot, except for the little platform, all painting. How it, much does that painting go for right dude, now? I don't know. I would love to have that painting. This shot. All painting except for the ATAT. -AT. Oh, that's how they get you, is they add people walking around the side. Exactly. They have the emperor coming down off the platform, the little droids sliding around. All those things trick your mind and say, oh, yeah, this is a full thing. This is, this is a whole shebang. Before yeah. we watch Hoth, you guys want to watch a video of the guy in the wampa suit falling over all the, like, hold up, <laughs> what, what, the Yeti? He was trying to walk in snow on two and a half foot stilts. With his mask on, he was 11 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he just gave up on life. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've explained a bunch of crazy techniques they've used so far in Star Wars. Let's watch it all come together in an amazing tour de force of visual effects spectacularity. This video binoculars. So what they did is they did a stop motion animation of the AT-AT -AT walking and then projected that onto a, a film screen, and then took a video camera and recorded the film screen panning up and down to get the binocular look. Wow, all right. <laughs> Super <laughs> cool. They only had three AT-AT -AT models. The two little ones in the background are literally just cardboard cutouts. No way! <laughs> but they matched them perfectly. They the did. lighting is exactly the same, the perspective is the same, but they're a cardboard cutout? The feet are hidden for where it makes contact with the ground. Oh, dude, making your job easier. Because when it comes to stop motion, you need to anchor your stop motion model to the, like, the floor to be able to animate it. So trying to show the feet where all the bolts and pins are can be a huge pain. All right, coming in. This shot right here is insane. That seriously looks like a drone racing shot. If you watch what happens here, the camera flies underneath the legs of the AT-AT -AT, while, by the way, noticing the AT-AT -AT is walking through the snow and leaving tracks. I just realized it did go through. How did that? Okay, <laughs> sorry, continue. The animator has a trap door that he opens and he moves the AT-AT -AT, and he can't brush or touch any of the snow around the feet because the footprints need to be actual real footprints made by the motion. So he has to be very, very careful. Next, the camera flies under the legs of the AT-AT. -AT. So what they're doing is the motion controlled camera rig. Okay. And then when it gets close Close to the AT-80. -AT, Do they just they lift, lift it up and the over? model up and take the model out? <laughs> it's flawless. <laughs> Can't now the model's tell. gone. Cable detached. <gasps> I saw it. I saw a stop motion thing there. <laughs> you saw it. The, uh, the snow pops into place like something happened between takes. Boop. There, that last little <laughs> pop there. It was a big nudge of snow up on the on the surface that wasn't there a frame before. Dang, explosion. that explosion, all the debris. Yeah. Dude, that's sick. Oh, another cool thing about how they do all the explosions is that they shoot them in very slow motion. Because a tiny little explosion is like this, pa, done. Whereas <laughs> a big explosion is like, pa. <laughs> so you're able to emulate that sort of motion by filming it really fast to mm -hmm. make it slow-mo. I love how like those little embers are going through the air like that. Oh, that's because they actually filmed that for real going through the air. Yeah, it's on a cable, it's a little zip line. And they're just recording it against the blue screen. Dang, that, that gave you like the best looking simulation possible. Yeah. If they just filmed that statically, you wouldn't have the atmospherics flying through it. Yeah, the wind direction's correct.
Oh, dude, look at that. That, yeah. was, that was definitely stop motion because you can see the stutteriness. That's the it. brief glimpse of the ATST, the chicken walker as they called it. It was a great idea to have a whole like space battle, not in space, because it gives you like visuals to see in the background other than just like a star field. Yeah, the Hoth scene is an incredible demonstration of all this hard work coming together and really like some old school techniques, like just basic Ray Harryhausen style stop motion, but then combined with like a very inventive approach to shooting all of it and combining it with live action. Can you imagine being Mark Hamill and be like, oh yeah, we filmed this. It took a while, it was hard work, like they're doing some groundbreaking stuff, hopefully it works. And then you show up to the movie theater and you see this and you're just like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so as always, we ask you to please leave a comment below if there's a TV show or movie or even just a scene that you would like us to break down and react to. But if you'd like to have direct control over what we react to, the best way to do that is to support us on Patreon because every patron gets to vote on one of the things that we will be reacting to. So that's a way to have direct access to us. And there's a couple patrons we would like to thank right now. Thank you, Jack O'Connell. Bobby Hansel, shout outs. Harris Regipagic. Philip Oxford. We're thinking about you, Ellen Almanza. Nada, Canadian spy. Skinky Snack. The Glitch Cube. And Brian and Tosin. Thank you guys for supporting us. If you guys like what we do here, want to consider supporting us. It means the world to us. It helps us do what we do. We do have a little bit of merch left because today and tomorrow are like literally the last days you can place an order and still get it by Christmas this year. CorridorDigital.store. Wait, I didn't hear you. CorridorDigital.store? CorridorDigital.store.